you know, we need, you know, shelter, we need uh, human love, if you like, we need security, we need education, uh, we need good health, and so on. These are, these are finite, and addressing those needs would keep us very busy, but would make us all feel much, much better. Now, this might sound um, idealistic, but I, I, I think it's what we as human beings want and need. And um, yes. when, we, when we get it, we feel much better. And I think we're gradually learning. The pandemic has been a real lesson. This is Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Anne Pettifer, a famous British economist, originally from South Africa, who has led things like Debt Jubilee in 2000, prescient diagnosis of a forthcoming great financial crisis and an author back in, I believe, 2007 and 8 of a proposal for what we now call the Green New Deal. We're here to look at the challenge that we all sense is not on, not on the horizon. It's right in front of us at this juncture. In her book, from 2019, Verso Books, The Case for a Green New Deal, is an extraordinary exploration of the scope and the scale of what we must do to address this challenge for humankind. And thank you for joining me today. Pleasure. And uh, I, I really look forward to this. I, I've, how would I say, been invigorated in reading the book in preparation for this. I'm sure our audience will be as well when they read the book, but also when they hear your vision of where we go. But let's start with a simple question. What inspired you to write this book in this time window? Um, I think it was that, you know, I'd seen what had happened. You know, we, we wrote the original report back in 2007, um, eight, yeah. and it was a battle to get that written because the battle between the environmentalists in our group and the economists in the macroeconomists in the group to kind of get ourselves to work together to produce the report. And then, as you say, uh, um, the, the report didn't go very far until AOC and the Justice Democrats picked it up. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly it was out there. But what I was seeing increasingly was that people were talking about the technocratic side of what kind of technology is, or do we need to save this, to solve this problem? Whereas what I wanted to argue was that actually we have to think about the economics, we have to think about the economic system and its link to the ecosystem. And because so much of economics is expressed in terms that are beyond the comprehension of ordinary folk, if you like, you know, the thing that inspires me is to be able to talk to fellow activists about macroeconomics. And it's, it's not rocket science is what I'm clear about. But the way it's often discussed and talked about is as if it were a, a kind of, uh, you know, physics post quantum theory kind of thing. So, um, uh, this is what I this is this is the inspiration is to share my understanding of macroeconomics with environmentalists and ecologists with the people on the ground that are arguing for this change so that they, they can be empowered, if you like. And I, and I have to say that I've seen that in action before. When we began the campaign, Jubilee 2000, which was for the cancellation of the sovereign debts of 30 countries or so, people said to me, well, you know, people didn't understand what it was about, didn't understand the relationship between international creditors and debtors, sovereign debtors. Mm -hmm. But we found it wasn't really hard to explain. And once people got it, and they got sometimes the most complex of ideas, they acted. And so for me, that's my inspiration. People, once they understand something, are capable of it in the most extraordinary action and transformation. Mm -hmm. Well, I found it fascinating, obviously, in what we now call the ESG world, that yeah. you bridge from the technology of climate transformation mm -hmm. to finance and the incentive structures. And I did uh, sense in your writing and in some of your references related to Carl Pogliani and others yeah. that uh, you think it's important that the 
which you might call unbridled free market financial system be channeled in a constructive direction or or structurally changed quite significantly can you can you tell us a little bit about why you feel that and what you would do in that in that realm gosh rob so it takes us back to the nature of money which i think is still mm -hmm. really really understood and and credit as a kind of spigot uh, which we can turn on and if we turn it on in a way uh, which is unregulated, which is unmanaged, we can spew out enormous quantities of credit, which become debt. And if that credit is aimed at consumption, if it's aimed at, uh, I don't know, extraction uh, of, of fossil fuels, or it, it's aimed at increasing our ability to go shopping, then of course there are going to be greenhouse gas emissions uh, come from that. And so what I wanted to do is to draw the line between the spigot of credit creation and the price of that credit, which is the rate of interest, essentially, and the relationship between that and finance, and then, you know, the build-up of, of debts, both sovereign and private and corporate debts, but ultimately the build-up of emissions. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I always tell the story of, you know, my, my children leaving school and going to university and suddenly having thrust in their hands credit cards before they had any source of income. But simply because they were going to university, the banks were in there and giving them credit cards and, and inviting them to borrow and to spend without any income. And of course, what they wanted to spend it on wasn't uh, on more books for university, but on going on, you know, foreign holidays in the university breaks. Mm -hmm. So, so it was this, it's this disconnect between the creation of credit and our ability to repay. And, and there are limits to our ability to repay. And there are ecological as well as economic limits to our ability to repay. And, and I think that's really the important point to make. Now, under today's free market, so-called free market, it's extraordinarily, it's extraordinary how, how dependent the free market now is on the state and in particular on central banks. Mm -hmm. But the ideology of free markets is that there should be no management of the credit creation process that actually we should trust the, the invisible hand to allocate mm -hmm. resources efficiently. Well, of course, it turns out that the invisible hand can't allocate resources mm -hmm. efficiently. So there's much about um, the theory of, of, of money and finance, which is, is really flawed and which results in... So for me, the challenge is to in help ecologists and environmentalists to understand those connections and not to think that you know economics belongs in a separate silo and for economists to understand that actually their theories are leading to the kind of unsustainable emissions that we have today mm -hmm. well like you mentioned the credit uh, we'll call an acceleration of credit can yeah. increase the rate of pollution and carbon burning the other dimension which uh, economists often call externalities or public goods is that when you're financing something and some of the benefit comes from protecting the common good through protecting the environment, that may not bear the financial return yeah. that a private transaction does. So you can do reckless things and be more credit worthy than if you're actually doing wholesome things. And Absolutely. it's really dependent upon, as you described, how you frame what the credit allocation process yeah. is, looks like. You mentioned things like, I often call the bailouts of 2008-9, the mother of all moral hazards, because it yeah. foments believing that you're, you can be too big to fail. You yeah. can gain market share because nobody thinks you'll default, but smaller institutions will. And you can lend even more aggressively because somebody will clean it up for you. And so we have that that's just in that container. But when we meld this with climate, yeah, the nature of the social return versus the private return becomes another uh, we might call front row consideration. Absolutely. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I mean, it wasn't just the bailout of 2008. It was the bailout of March 2020. You know, the Fed mm -hmm. bailed yes, out the banking system. And so mm -hmm. 
you know, capitalism has evolved, Rob. It's evolved beyond what we think of it as. You know, we used to think of it as the, the production of commodities and the trade trade in commodities and goods and services. Well, now, capitalism has become something quite different because by, by allowing, you know, the credit creation process, the financial system to de be detached, if you like, from regulatory oversight, in particular democratic regulatory oversight, We've allowed capitalism to evolve to evolve into this thing, which it is now. We're actually it is is mainly concerned with, and, and Susan K. Sell is really good on this. Uh, is re is not concerned with competition within countries. It's com it's concerned with competitiveness, global competitiveness, and, mm -hmm. and global competitiveness not in goods and services, but in intangibles, in things like you know, um, intellectual property or, um, you know, or, and, and financial services. And this is, and these are all rent seeking activities. So and what's striking to me is that economists allow this to happen or agree with this and, and indeed are responsible for this particular framework that we have today. And, mm -hmm. and what it's resulting in is the failure of capitalism to create and produce new assets, essentially, but actually to feed off existing assets. So we see, you know, capital wanting to invest, for example, in London property or New York property or in, and in old Victorian buildings in London, which have become extraordinarily valuable and extracting rent from those old assets rather than doing what we all thought entrepreneurial capitalism was about, which is to create new assets. And we need capitalism now to create the kind of assets we yeah. need to tackle the clim climate breakdown and biodiversity loss. Um, and capitalism is not fit for that anymore. So, mm -hmm. the, so the whole financialization and the whole domination of the, of the economy by, or by, a, if you like, by private authority, you know, with private players deciding on our futures instead of public mm -hmm. authority. Um, you know, we're, at, we're in a situation where all that capitalism wants to do is to effortlessly, effortlessly extract rent from existing assets and not mm -hmm. create new assets. So, you know, you know, it's contradicting in it, it's contradictory in itself, if you like. Yeah, I, I remember in my reading uh, of British economists, I remember a gentleman named Fred Hirsch, and he yeah. talked about positional goods. More recently, Adair Turner, when he was a senior fellow at INET, wrote a book yeah. called Between Debt and the Devil, where he underscored exactly the kind of things you're talking about, which is you have collateral-based lending for real estate yeah. exploding, and we have central banks and bailouts and everything to support that. And the myth was, as I, I think you alluded to, what we were really doing was creating capital formation for new assets, which we might call enhanced productivity. But mm -hmm. what we were doing was taking old assets and revaluing them and creating wealth effects in exactly. what Fred Hirsch called positional goods. And uh, uh, so mm -hmm. is this system, if you will, producing the kind of outcomes that yeah. warrant the kind of guarantees that have been granted. And yeah. Adair was saying, I think in agreement with you, that there's quite a contradiction there. Absolutely. And, you know, the other contradiction, I mean, I mean for me, it may, be, may not be a contradiction, but the other challenge is that it's anti-democratic, essentially. So, so the state <coughs> has become, as others have argued, a collateral factory. You know, the state is creating assets, i.e., debt, sovereign debt, and the private sector can't get enough of that, really. You know, and that's why we, we see, you know, um, the prices of, uh, of bonds rising, the, the yields falling as dramatically as they have been. Mm -hmm. And yet, while the, the state is a collateral factory, you know, it's simultaneously attacked for creating the debt, which becomes so vi such vital collateral for the private finance sector. You know, I mean, while the private finance sector might value an asset like London property, there is nothing as safe as 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 British debt, uh, as sovereign British debt, or, or or of course U.S. debt, 
um, for the uh, f as for collateral for the purposes you rightly argue of uh, of obtaining additional wealth. And so these these contradictions within capitalism are extraordinary. And and it brings me back to you know to the old taxpayer. Frankly, I would if I was to build a movement now or try to. I'm too old, but. I would want to build a movement of taxpayers and call, the, call it the Taxpayers Alliance and say, we are demanding to know why, you know, you are using our assets, um, you know, the, the, the collateral created by the state and backed up by taxpayers, and the value of the collateral is entirely dependent on the fact that we pay our taxes every year into the Treasury, which gives the Treasury and the Federal Reserve the power that it has to create liquidity. Well, then what are the terms and condition, conditions of that? And there are no terms and conditions at the moment. You mm -hmm. know, Wall Street can get bailed out by the Federal Reserve um, every time it messes up or every time there's a shock. And, and then the reason why Wall Street has consolidated itself, if you like, and expanded its borrowing since both 2007-9 and 2020, and, you know, the, the amount of wealth generated through the pandemic is quite extraordinary, is because it was able to draw on these uh, these bailouts from the Federal Reserve, from the taxpayer, without terms and conditions. And, and I find that, I think that's what I want to wake up, um, for, you know, people to, because really it's, it's our taxes and our money and our hard work and the fact that we're employed and able to pay taxes that is actually upholding Wall Street, to put it very crudely. Mm -hmm. And yet Wall Street mm -hmm. treats treats the state with, with effectively with contempt, in my view. Yeah. Well, in the, in the United States, there's a great deal of concern about the role of money in politics, where, in yeah. essence, what, what I call the commodification of social design and enforcement yeah. becomes uh, essentially where, you might say, a sector becomes the architect of how it's regulated and how it's subsidized. And the politicians need to, which you might call, heed their demands in yeah. order to get the war chest to get reelected. And yeah. uh, so these these are very uh, complicated things unless you naively separate the domain of politics from the economy as though they're yeah. mutually exclusive. But a political yeah. economy doesn't, doesn't look like that. And... No. Uh, I think well, let's let's go. You started writing a Green New Deal report. I remember uh, Jeff Tilley, who's a monetary economist that I've admired and I saw referred to in this book, was part of your group. And yeah. but what inspired you at that time? Was it concern about climate, or was it seeing this misallocation that the financial sector? fostered? What, what was that first report about? Well, that first report was about the arguments we had with the environmentalists and, and the arguments over monetary theory and policy, which wasn't understood at all. Um, you know, and, and I think Jeff Tiley is really is a really important inspiration and mm -hmm. mentor for me. And what he taught me was about Keynes, essentially, and Keynes' understanding of the nature of the monetary system and the need to do to the monetary system what had to be done in the 1930s, which is to subordinate it to the interests of democracy, if you like, and to remove it from its role as master of the economy and instead to turn it back into being servant to the economy. Mm -hmm. But I think really what transformed my thinking was an understanding of Keynes and an understanding that Keynes is so fearfully misrepresented that as being about tax and spend, as about being about fiscal policy, when really he was deeply uninterested in fiscal policy. But he was, he was convinced that by managing monetary theory, monetary policy, it was possible to manage and the prosperity of the economy as a whole. And, and, you know, Keynes is no lefty. I mean, he was just a traditional capitalist, if you like, and he understood that in order for capitalism to be sustainable. Um, and he did have more than a vision than just that, of course, but he, but he understood that for that to happen, the monetary system had to be managed. And that took me, I mean, took me back to the whole question of the nature of money and the fact that 
today there's still massive misunderstanding. The very fact that the public authorities, Rob, tolerate cryptocurrencies and the fraud and the corruption and around around cryptocurrencies mm-hmm. seems to me to be an expression of the fact that there is still confusion around the commodity theory of money as to the credit theory of money. Mm-hmm. And of course, Keynes was on the side of the credit theory of money. And I mean, yes. he himself had to struggle with with those ideas at the beginning. And what, but once he got it, you know, he then understood really, given that it's a social construct and not a commodity, money is something that has to be managed or else we could just magic, magic it out of thin air. And we do yes. magic it out of thin air. But that's a reason for us not behaving as if we were the um, sorcerer's appen- apprentice, you know, yes, messing yes. around with sorcerer's pail and, pail and brush, uh, to quote Goethe, Goethe's famous story. Um, you know, it is something that we, we have to manage, but, but Wall Street would rather ha- we weren't managing it, and above all would prefer for it not to be dem- the system not to be democratically managed. So that, and and you know that's it's that understanding of Keynes that I've found uh, mm-hmm. has inspired me all the way through, and I struggle on a daily basis. I, I see how Keynes is misrepresented and and abused, and and in particularly also in terms of the history. And, and I hope you will have read the bit about 1919 and his his ideas for the international system that came out. Oh yeah. Expressed at tre- Versailles. Treaty of Versailles, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, the other part of Keynes that, that is a building block to awareness is yeah. his PhD dissertation, the treatise on probability, was yeah. really about what we call ontological uncertainty, or some yeah. would call radical uncertainty, the unknown unknowns. And yeah. these systems, like uh, the monetary system and the value of liquidity, was quite integrated with coping with unknown unknowns and yeah. how to, uh, which you might call, stabilize a, an anxious system that doesn't have a terminal point that everybody believes in. And so th- I thought he was very, very sophisticated in the way in which, uh, like, the whole body of his work yes. worked from a different vision of what society was than what we call mechanical Keynesian macroeconomics that uh, my alma mater, MIT, and other places uh, emphasized in the years following. Yeah, I, Rob, I'm very struck by this uh, economist at the Fed. Is it Jeremy B. Rudd and his, um, yes. his recent paper that's caused such a stir? Uh, yes. And I have to say, um, who was, I said, when he was absolutely right, when he, he talked about the primary role of mainstream economics in our society is to provide an apologetics for a criminally <laughs> oppressive, unsustainable and unjust social order. I mean, coming yes. out of the Fed, that was pretty wonderful. But in dealing with that, Adam Posen then argued that, um, at, that you know, we're at the level, uh, macroeconomics is at the level, he said, of Galileo and Copernicus. And we're just still at the at the stage of uh, finding figuring out the basics of how the universe, the, the financial universe works. Well, and I and I love Adam Posen; he's an old friend, but I think he's wrong on this because we're not at the stage of Galileo and Copernicus. Keynes oh. took us to a far more advanced stage in you mm-hmm. know in his work, but we've. Re- you know, we've regressed from that. And I don't think that's accidental, Rob. You know, I have to say I'm something of a conspiracy theorist when it comes to this, because in my view, you know, Keynes was deliberately, and I think he was naive. I think there was, you know, quite a long, he was quite, he he didn't manage this terribly well. But I think he was naive in thinking that his friends in the city of London and indeed in the economics profession would eventually be persuaded of his arguments and wouldn't try to subvert and undermine them. But they actively did so even before he died. So, yes. you know, they were actively undermining Bretton Woods even as he left um, New Hampshire. So, so I, um, you know, I. but I, what I want to argue is that actually if we if we could restore an understanding of Keynes' monetary theory and policies, 
we go a long way to creating the kind of framework, economic framework that we need to tackle the big crises of our day, which is, mm -hmm. of course, climate breakdown. Yeah, well, there are a lot of uh, elements. I, I studied a lot of the students of Keynes, and one in particular, Lori Tarsish, came to the United States and wrote a book about Keynesian, like a textbook of Keynesian theory, and was punished by elites, particularly, uh, I think it was William Buckley at the uh, Yale University, yeah. kind of put out a call to trustees and boards all over that this man was a heretic and this book had to be stopped. And after that, in what I would call in and around the McCarthyite era, people were much more cautious and much more mechanical and abstract in what they would represent in the United States and, and perhaps in the entire Anglo-Saxon world. But this uh, group now that they call the post-Keynesians, many of whom I believe were educated at Cambridge, England, uh, and many are in Italy and parts of the United States, uh, some of whom have emphasized what we might explore, modern monetary theory, which I think relates to your proposals. Uh, there's, there's a great deal of um, skepticism mm -hmm. that Rudd really put out yes. hard. And, and with the, that footnote about why at the beginning, he really he issued a very, very bold challenge that I no, think we should all listen to. I absolutely so, uh, agree with that, yeah. Yeah, Neil Irwin just wrote this up in the New York Times this last week. And, uh, I noticed that. Uh, I noticed you know, they left out his, uh, his footnote. You know, they, they, they yes. <laughs> inflation expectations, but they left out the powerful footnote. But yes. I think... Yes. Um, so, Rob, it was really difficult. You know, I, I mean, I studied Samuelson at university, and I found it, even in, in the South African context, really incomprehensible in relation to the real world that I lived in. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for many economists, they're having to go back to square one and finding that very, very difficult, really, because they've been trained to think so differently. But, you know, I'm hopeful people learn, people can change, um, and we, you know, the Jeremy B. Rudds can turn up. So, uh, and you know, there are an awful lot of people out there that know there's something wrong, seriously yeah. wrong. It just takes some courage to come out and say it. Let's talk about your vision of where do we go so that my grandchildren and children feel safe and feel like they're in a coherent world and, and yours too. <laughs> yeah. So in the book, I, um, I, I try to, um, I, I basically echo the, the, the words of uh, the work of Herman Daly um, yes. in, in calling for a steady state economy, for mm -hmm. a recognition, you know, of the second law of thermodynamics that every time we burn fossil fuels, it doesn't evaporate and go away. It just becomes something else. Um, so, you know, the, it, the vision is for a steady state economy. And I think that's going to mean uh, an economy where we're going to have lower levels of consumption. Um, we're going to probably be less mobile in the sense of, you know, we're going to have to uh, be a more, um, have much simpler lifestyles. But while those lifestyles might be simpler uh, and might be more labor intensive, we're going to have to substitute, if you like, uh, carb uh, labor for carbon. We're going to have to get out of our cars and perhaps cycle around or find other ways of moving around which are not so damaging. Um, while that might feel like, um, might, might feel risky, in fact, it could actually lead to something, to a very rich and um, abun a life of abundance, in my view. And, and I think mm -hmm. we learned some of this through the pandemic. I don't know about you, Rob, but where I live, which is a deeply conservative rural part of Britain, I was just so overwhelmed by the sense of community, the way in which people came together, you know, the idea of working collectively to manage the situation. Uh, you know, we're supposed to be so individuated, such individuals caring only for number one. It turned out, well, actually, we're not like that. You know, we have the extraordinarily rare uh, 
for, for our species, for, for the world's species, human qualities of empathy and compassion and of collective action. No other species mm -hmm. can do those things. And no other species has that level of empathy, mm. of compassion, and of ability to work collectively. And the pandemic showed, brought out those hum, those tremendous mm -hmm. human qualities. And I think those will be extraordinarily enriching. We've seen the, the, the effect of it, as well as, of course, the fact that we engaged with nature far more. You know, we stopped and looked around at what's, you know, the fact that the bees are in decline and, and that we need to grow wildflowers or whatever to, to help with that. And and that was better for our well-being and particularly our mental, that is much better for our mental well-being. So for me, it's that, that's what I look forward to, is to a world where actually there's a much greater sense of community. Um, we're not shopping endlessly. Uh, we're not consuming endlessly. Um, we're not, as a, I, I, I work with a wonderful uh, economist, um, sociologist actually, who argues that in, in, an, in this world we will be satisfying our needs, but not our wants, not our desires. And our desires mm -hmm. can rise exponentially, can grow exponentially, but our needs are limited. You know, we need, you know, shelter, we need... Uh, human love if you like we need security we need education uh, we need good health and so on these are these are finite and addressing those needs would keep us very busy but would make us all feel much much better now this might sound um idealistic but i i, I think it's <clears throat> what we as human beings want and need and um, yes. when we when we get it, we feel much better. And I think we're gradually learning. The pandemic has been a real lesson, I think, in that regard.